the mature black bear was only 37 yards away. He had no idea we were there, but time was short. We were at the thin edge of shooting light and my little Audrey, just turned 10 years old and on her very first big game hunt, was peering through a red dot sight. Because of the low light, she struggled to see the bear clearly. Whispering our way through the process, I helped her find the bear's shoulder, after which she did her best to glue the glowing red dot right behind it and squeeze. At the shot, the bear whipped around and bit savagely at its rib cage, right where I'd told Audrey to shoot. Then, like smoke on a high wind, that bear vanished into the fern-choked underbrush. Minutes after, it was full dark. We found no blood. Bear tracks were everywhere and nowhere. Backing out, we resolved to come back the next morning. It rained hard all that night, and when we returned, the ground was just a soaking morass of mud and decaying vegetation. Five of us gritted that canyon side for hours, looking for Audrey's bear. It was jungle thick and hard as we tried. We never did find that bear. Did she make a good shot? Well, I thought so, but perhaps not. We'd realized that she didn't have the right optic on her little 6.5 Grendel rifle. A scope with a bit of magnification and a lot more light gathering ability than that red dot would have helped her see the bear better. Plus, of course, I found myself agonizing over whether I'd set Audrey up for failure by giving her a 6.5 Grendel to shoot at a mature bear with. Clearly, it didn't anchor the bear, and the bullet didn't exit and leave a blood trail that we could have followed the evening she shot it. We'll never know. Whichever scenario happened, it's those sorts of lessons that shape our future choices in equipment. Now, our topic of the day today is scopes and sights for close-range hunting. It's inspired by listeners' questions after the last episode, the one where we talked about rifles, cartridges, and bullets for close-range hunting. I had a lot of great response off of that, and I had a lot of folks write in and say, hey, uh, what do I put? What kind of optic or sights do I put on my close-range hunting rifle? Probably my favorite was a listener who wrote and said, hey, thanks for the heads up that uh, Ruger is going to make an African, an M77 African rifle chambered in 35 Whalen. I ran down to my uh, local gun shop and got one on order. Now, what kind of scope do I put on it? So I love that sort of message, and it's, um, you know, subject close to my own heart because I also have one of those rifles on order, and I also am considering the best optic to put on it. So before we dig in a public service announcement, if I can use that term, we are holding a little informal meet and greet at the upcoming Western Hunting and Conservation Expo in Salt Lake City, Utah. If you're attending the show, please join us at the Barnes Bullets booth at 2 p.m. on Friday the 16th. That's in February. Hope to see you there. Okay, what exactly is close range hunting and what sort of scope or sighting system is most useful? Let's define some parameters. So first, what exactly is close range hunting? Personally, I like to think of it as anything from zero to 250 yards. Uh, That's uh, Probably a pretty broad spectrum um, designation for a lot of hunters, a lot of folks in the northeast, northwest, deep south, anywhere that most of the game lives in real thick woods, aren't used to shooting far. In fact, uh, in some of those areas, 80 yards is a long shot. But for what I do, anything out to about 250 yards, I can usually shoot without making any adjustment to my scope or holding over significantly with a standard high power big game cartridge. Now, that brings us to our next criteria for defining close range hunting. It's any distance where you don't have to dial your scope or use a holdover method to hit your target. So this is somewhat dependent on your cartridge, right? And I gotta give credit where credit is due. My friend Jeff Johnston was the one that introduced that way of looking at uh, close range hunting to me. And I kinda like it. So if you're using something like a a 9.3 by 62 loaded with the heaviest bullets you can find for that cartridge and pushed kind of mildly, say you're loading for an old vintage rifle that you want to kind of baby a little bit, well, you're going to have a rainbow trajectory. You're not going to be able to just hold 
on hair and fire out to 250 yards and hit that animal through the vitals. So that's probably farther than close range with that cartridge, right? Now there are some things we can do about this holding over with slow cartridges. Uh, we can use a dial, and we'll talk about that more when we get to specific scope types that I uh, like to recommend. Now, another one, just before we move on, that fits this category is the grand old 3030. If you have a little 20 inch lever action carbine in 3030, you're probably not going to be able to hold on hair and hit vitals out to 250 yards either. Any close range rifle, I tend to zero at 100 yards. This is a departure from my Western hunting rifles, right? But we're talking kind of heavy hitting cartridges, often a little bit slower velocities than the traditional open country cartridge. And if most of your shots are gonna occur inside 150 or even inside 100 yards, there's no need to, to zero at 200. Again, if you have a dial of turret, that can make this sort of setup very versatile. We'll talk more about that here in a minute. So now let's talk about what kind of conditions create close range hunting. Well, big timber, of course, is probably the, the first one and the most popular one. So whether you're a, a whitetail hunter in Vermont that likes to track big deer in snow, in fresh snow, or you hunt big swamp country in the south, the deep south, where there's giant trees hanging with moss and so forth, or you're just a brush country hunter, uh, whether it's thickets in Africa or Texas, or even uh, you know parts of Arizona, Gosh, there's river bottom thickets through most of the Rocky Mountains. Any of that kind of country uh, is, you know, creates a sort of condition that requires close range hunting, right? So these are all uh, pretty obvious categories. Now, for those of us that have just spent a life hunting deer and maybe the occasional hog or whatnot, how about something else? How about dangerous game hunting? You may be able to see a big grizzly bear, or even a Cape Buffalo at 500 yards. But any savvy, dangerous game hunter will pass on that shot. You never take that shot because it's just, the probability of, of making a bad hit is just much too high. Plus, pouring on the authority, hitting a dangerous game animal with as much energy as possible is crucial to killing them quickly. And at 500 yards, your bullet, I don't care what cartridge you're shooting, your bullet has lost a lot of energy that it exited the muzzle with, right? So close and personal is kind of the name with dangerous game. And a good, good guide will never let you shoot past about 200 yards on a bear. And most of them won't let you shoot past about 100 yards on a Cape Buffalo. Now, a few times in the past, I've had experiences where I didn't expect to be hunting close, but weather conditions required it. I hunted antelope <laughs> on foot in heavy fog where we had to get within 80 yards before we could even see them. It was actually super cool. One of the most magical mule deer hunts I remember was in uh, snow, fresh falling snow, coming down thick, giant flakes, and you couldn't see past 60 or 80 yards there either. And I was walking alone through pinion and juniper forest with little glades and openings in it, and it was just as beautiful and spectacular as could be. There were deer all around and I kept bumping them really close. The stalking conditions were incredibly quiet and they just didn't expect to see me there. I never found a buck big enough to shoot, but it was an experience that clearly, I mean, 30 years later, I've never forgotten. So once we've decided we're setting up a, a rifle and scope for uh, this close range hunting, let's call it inside 250 yards. What must an optic or sight system offer to be really good at its job on such a rifle, right? Well, first of all, it has to be quick to aim. For scopes, this means it's gonna have low magnification and a wide field of view. The two usually come together, but there are some tricks that really good optic companies can do to increase your wide field of view and give you the, you know, the maximum uh, visibility there. For those of you unfamiliar with the concept of a wide field of view, it just means on a certain power, let's say your scope's set on three power, and you look at a target, say 100 yards away, or a landscape, you're going to see a wide width of that landscape. 
another scope that may not be engineered quite as well, you're going to see a narrower width of that landscape. The wide width of landscape, also known as a wide field of view, is crucial to helping you pick up moving animals quickly. That really contributes to a, a scope's quick to aim characteristics. Now, of course, low magnification. How low is low? You know, a, a true one power on the bottom end means no magnification at all. Now, for a long time, scopes might be labeled 1x, but they were really about 1.5 to 1.75x. And so when you tried to shoot with both eyes open, which is the most instinctive, fastest way to aim a rifle, right? Uh, it didn't work too well because your one eye was getting an image that was about one and a half or a bit more than that, larger than the true image that your support eye was seeing. So as of the past, oh, probably 10 to 15 years, scope companies have been making a real effort to make 1X scopes true 1X. Now, shooting with the one eye open can, can be quite challenging for, uh, for some hunters. They're just not used to it. They're used to squinting one eye shut while they aim, right? And it's actually not the best way. Even when you're using a high magnification scope, your support eye should remain open, but your aiming eye, should be your dominant eye, right, will take precedence and it'll kind of wash out what your uh, support eye is seeing. It just helps though to raise a rifle, orient on a target quickly, and find your target in your scope if you're using both eyes. Really makes a big difference. So low magnification, how low is, in, is crucial. You know, for dangerous game, I really do like a true 1X on the bottom. So you're gonna end up with something like a, a one to four, or possibly in some of the higher end stuff, a one to five, one to six, or even a one to eight. The scope right here is a one to eight. We'll talk more about those here in a little bit. Now, if you're not worried about shooting with the true 1X, uh, you know, like if you're not worried about having a Cape Buffalo or a coastal brown bear come boiling out of a thicket 20 feet away from you, then you're probably just fine with two to two and a half power on the bottom end, or even just a good old classic three power, like in a three to nine. So as long as your scope is of high quality, you get a reasonably wide field of view. As long as you're hunting non-dangerous game, you know, I think a two and a half, two power is just fine. One of my favorites, we'll talk about this uh, more in a minute, is on my 93 by 62 Mauser, and it's a, a one and a half to five. And on one power, you can really catch fast moving targets up close quickly. It works very well. Okay, what else is a, you know, what other characteristics should your sighting system have? Well, let's talk about iron sights for a minute. If you have iron sights on your rifle, they should possess high visibility and clarity. It's funny, but you know, like the, the buckhorn sights that were popular on Western rifles, or at least people think they were, and so a lot of reproductions are made with these giant buckhorn rear sights and bead front sights. It's about as bad a combination as I can think of. A bead front sight is just a big round glob that you have to plaster somewhere on your game animal. A square topped post that's nice and crisp is much, much better for uh, placing your elevation on, uh, on a game animal. And a rear sight that's nice and open on top lets in plenty of light to that notch will help you uh, take a much more consistent sight picture. The best of the type, of course, are aperture sights, also uh, informally known as peep sights on the rear of the receiver. That gives you maximum distance between your sights. So your, they call it sight radius, is long, and that really helps you uh, achieve consistency when you're shooting. That's the reason long-barreled rifles used to always have such a reputation for accuracy. It wasn't the length of the barrel, it was the length of the sight radius that was making the difference. Kind of cool little bit of trivia for you there. So another um, characteristic that all of your sights and scopes should have for close range hunting is a very instinctive point ability. Now we talked about this a little bit. Shooting with both eyes open helps. Shooting with iron sights where you're kind of looking down the barrel of your rifle also helps. There's a couple of important things to this. One, you've got to have your scope mounted as low as possible so that you can bring your rifle to your cheek like you would a shotgun and be looking right through the scope if possible. 
the fastest rifles were built for iron sights and they'd line your eye up with those sights immediately and just look straight down the barrel through the sights at your target. If that's an incoming dangerous game animal or a fast departing whitetail in the big woods, that's crucial, right? Another really important characteristic is to have a high contrast, easy to see reticle. My favorite of these types are those with illuminated dots. Now, of course, be aware of local regulations and in, in some areas you can't use illuminated reticles. I don't like reticles that have a big amount of illumination, like a great big Christmas tree holdover type reticle, or the whole thing glows inside your scope. I like a simple illuminated dot in the very center of my crosshairs. I figure if I'm shooting fast, I'm not shooting long, so I don't need all those holdover reticles. And if I'm shooting in very low light, I'm not going to shoot very far. So again, I don't need a bunch of illuminated hash marks to confuse my eye and obscure the target that I'm trying to find down range. So uh, on a similar note, front focal plane scopes, also called first focal plane scopes, are not good for fast shooting. Uh, generally, when you back the magnification way off, the reticle almost disappears. That's uh, a big disadvantage when you're trying to make a precise shot. Because even up close, you got to place your shot carefully, right? There are some exceptions to this rule. There are some front focal plane reticles that are illuminated and have like a horseshoe shape or something around the center. And when you zoom it way off, that horseshoe shape kind of recedes into basically a, a dot or a tiny circle in the center of your scope. And then you just shoot it like it was a red dot. That works pretty well. Okay, what else is important for an a scope or sights on a rifle for close range shooting. I would say durability is pretty important because you're not going to be hiking up a mountain with this rifle stuffed into the padded backside of your uh, backpack, right? You're not going to have a folding stock on this. Probably not going to have a big soft neoprene cover on your scope to protect it from getting bumped and banged and scraped. In the big woods, in deep thickets, in rough country, your rifle takes a beating. Sometimes it's just an unfortunate fact of that type of hunting. So having a high quality scope that can take some hard knocks is real important. Another one is that you get maximum light transfer. And usually that means you've got a good sized objective bell on the front of your scope, but not always. On a low powered scope, such as a you know, my one to five on my nine three by sixty two, you zoom that back off to one and a half power, and this small twenty four millimeter front end of that scope brings in plenty of light. In fact, on that scope it's it's twenty four millimeter I I told you a lie, it's twenty millimeters up front. You can divide the size of the objective lens in your scope by the magnification you're using. And as long as you get a number of at least four, that scope is going to transfer all the light that you need back to your eye. So let's use an example, this one to five by 20. Even on maximum power, if I divide 20 by five, I've got four. That means the shaft of light that's coming out the back of that scope is four millimeters in diameter. They call it the exit pupil diameter. That's the light exiting the scope into your pupil, the pupil of your eye. In very low light conditions, your pupil expands to about four millimeters. So as long as that exit pupil light shaft is four millimeters, you theoretically are getting all the light your eye can absorb. Now there's a caveat to this. As with most technical things like this, what if your eye isn't perfectly centered behind the scope? What if you're shooting in a hurry and just trying to pick up those crosshairs and put a shot very quickly onto whatever it is, whether it's an incoming thing with big teeth and a bad attitude or a departing wounded animal you're trying to finish off, whatever the case may be, you know, as, as dark comes on. So in that case, I always back my scope off a little bit. So I'm getting an exit pupil of five millimeters or six millimeters in diameter because that's forgiving. As long as I get my eye somewhere near the middle of that scope, I'm going to have all the light I can use. This 1.5 to 5x scope with a 20 millimeter objective, geez, so many numbers my tongue is twisting up here. You can back it off to about three. If you divide 20 by three, you've got an exit pupil of nearly 
seven millimeters that's plenty right it works pretty darn well even without a big front objective bell so not to get off on a tangent there for too long but that's a good way to uh, calculate the light transferring capability of a scope uh, magnification range combined with its objective lens diameter that's the front lens diameter of course all of this is also very reliant on the quality of the glass and the coatings on that glass if you got poor quality glass it doesn't matter how big your exit pupil is it's still going to be kind of hazy and shadowy right it just can't transfer light through uh, poor quality glass that's not well coated to to minimize light refraction Moving on, how do you want to attach your scope to your rifle? You know, this is a matter of debate. If you can't really see iron sights, then attach them with whatever method you want because you're probably never going to take that scope off. If you only hunt somewhere where, uh, you know, you're no more than an hour or two from a gun shop where you can go and, and get some repairs done, some new parts done, uh, purchased and in, installed if you need them, at a few hours notice you know mount it however you want but if you're deep in the back country i recommend using a very high quality mounting system and a quick detach mounting system especially for a rifle where you may be going into thick brush after something that's hard to shoot whether that's a wounded deer scooting away through the ferns or uh, you know a bear coming your way through the ferns i like to be able to take the scope on my close range hunting rifles off with a heartbeat's notice, right? So there are several different types of rings and base setups that accomplish this really well. My 93x62 Dumlin Mauser has custom rings on it, uh, built by Joe Smithson, gunsmith, uh, wonderful, wonderful setup, but not something you're going to use on modern rifles. More appropriately, you probably use either something like a, a tally steel ring and base with uh, big levers that you just turn to lock those rings on. They're known, they're legendary for their return to zero capabilities. They're extremely strong. A lot of dangerous game hunters prefer them for use on heavy recoilers, such as a 458 lock and so forth. Another really good option is the QRW bases and rings by Leupold. It's uh, kind of a Picatinny or Weaver type base. It's nice and low to your at the top of your action. Cross slot type base. And then those rings have a big lever, kind of like the tallies do. Uh, and you can just pop those on and off. If you're using a Ruger, and this is kind of cool and kind of important because Ruger's made a real... Uh, effort to support big boar hunters and dangerous game hunters for years. They make probably the, the only really purpose designed controlled feed rifles that are compact and quick handling with iron sights for less than 1500 bucks on the market. You can get some really premium stuff by companies like uh, Park West Arms and others. But uh, if you're looking for a, a rifle that's really configured for close range shooting and hard hitting, something like Ruger's M77 uh, Hawkeye in either the Alaskan or the guide rifle is really hard to beat. They come with 20 inch barrels, stainless steel, very good controlled feed uh, action, Mauser based action with a heavy duty claw extractor. And the tops of all these actions are machined with a sort of uh, dovetail scope mounting system. It's proprietary to Ruger. It has some issues, but it's also very, very strong. Now, most of these rifles come with free rings. That's one of the selling points on the Ruger M77 rifle, right? But uh, they're not quick to take off. If you have a coin or if you have a Leatherman or something like that, you can usually wedge it in there in the, the tensioning bolt head and get it off, but it can take some time. It's not quick and easy. And putting it back on and bringing those uh, cross bolts to correct torque isn't nearly as easy to do in the field. So what I like to do is get uh, quick detach rings made for Ruger rifles from Alaska Arms LLC. He makes some really, really good quick detach all steel rings 
for those rifles, specifically for those rifles, and they are awesome. That's what I tend to use on my Ruger. They're a little pricey. It's worth it. So maybe we should circle back here a little bit and talk about why would you want to take that scope off? What are some reasons? Well, the one we've talked about, if you break your scope, right? We'll circle back to this a little bit more. But the other one is for extremely close work. If you can't see past about 20 feet in the brush, if you're tracking wounded game, particularly if it's dangerous wounded game, it sometimes is better to take your scope off so you can just darn near point shoot that rifle like a shotgun if something comes at you, where you may have less than a second to flick your safety off, get that barrel pointed at the oncoming critter's anatomy or head or whatever you're trying to hit and press that trigger. So this is something I recommend doing, but only if you practice quite a bit. So if you're gonna do this, Take the scope on and off now and then. And as you're walking through the woods, just whip your rifle up and slam a bullet into a stump. Whatever you need to do. Don't shoot stuff that can fracture and, you know, like a big rock up close is a bad idea. You could splash yourself with uh, fragments of your own bullet or, or that rock. But it's a good idea to practice this and get good at snapshots up really, really close. It's kind of the epitome of close range hunting, right, folks? So that's one primary reason for having the quick detach rings and uh, sights on your barrel of your close range rifle. Let's circle back now again and talk a little bit more about some of the most appropriate magnification ranges that we typically see in a variety of scopes. So 1 to 4x is pretty common. Trigicon makes a nice accu power that doesn't cost too much. They're a little heavy, but they work pretty well in that range. My favorite, as I've mentioned, is the Leupold 1.5 to 5X. Uh, the 2.5 to 8 by 32 Leupold is a terrific, sorry, excuse me, the 2.5 to 8 by 36 Leupold is a terrific scope. Has a very good uh, light transfer rating and has a really, really useful magnification range with a uh, low enough low end that you can use it on fast moving game up close and just high enough high end that you can make shots out at quite far distance as long as you can see the animal well right i saw rob gearing our dear old friend from spartan precision shoot his big old kudu bull in africa with that exact scope a two and a half to eight power leupold from 578 yards if memory serves and he smoked it right through the middle really really good shot uh, it was still kicking and so he put another shot on it on the x two in a row wonderful little scope and they're super light which is you know all of these that's one great advantage of having a light quick handling scope on your brush gun you don't want to be wrestling with a heavy overbalanced rifle with you know with a, a big massive scope on the top now a two and a half power is kind of a traditional choice in a fixed scope. And Leupold for years and years made a really, really good one. In fact, um, the legendary brown bear guide, Phil Shoemaker, used one on his 458 Winchester Magnum for, I think he, he wrote over 40 years and never had to adjust the scope once he got it zeroed, right? If Phil thinks a two and a half hour fixed scope is a good option for a 458 Winchester Magnum backup rifle for coastal brown bear hunting, guess what folks? It's a good option. And uh, the other cool thing is it only weighs about six ounces. They're so super light. I have one and I now cherish that thing because they've been discontinued. If you're interested in a scope like that, folks, they didn't cost very much. You'd probably find one used or possibly even a new but old stock scope in a gun shop somewhere. It's worth looking one up. If you ever just want the lightest little quick handling uh, close action scope you can find, that's probably it. How about a 2 to 10 power or even a 2 to 12? You know, I've used scopes by Burris and Night Force and Steiner and others that are in that range. They got a 2 power on the bottom end, 10 power or a bit more on the top end. Man, they're wonderful. If they're not too heavy for the type of rifle that you're threading your way through the brush with, 
It's a great option because again, it has a low enough low end for fast shots up close and a powerful enough high end that you can make pretty precise shots out there as far as, well, most of us have any right shooting, okay? Now, what about having a dial up turret? We're coming back to this now. Is it worth having one on a scope for close range? And folks, my 9.3 laying right here has one on it, okay? This is Leupold's CDS ZL turret. That stands for zero locking, also has a zero stop in it. And folks, I apologize if you think we're getting too much uh, Leupold mention here. Well, <clears throat> I don't think there's any such thing possible, but the fact is I've just used them more than any other and I really, uh, I've had such good luck with them throughout the decades that, well, I have more experience with them than probably most other uh, companies. And so, yeah, I use them for reference. That's just kind of how it shakes out. Plus, I'm entirely comfortable recommending them to you for use on your rifles. I trust mine completely. So, having a turret, a dial-up turret on your scope for close range hunting for that fast action type shooting up close is absolutely an advantage but only if it's got a locking turret on it this type of scope gets um, handled a lot and you don't want a turret that can be accidentally spun off by rubbing against your backpack or sliding in and out of a saddle scabbard on a horse or even just sliding across the truck seat as you stick it in the back seat of your pickup right so having a locking turret is really important on a close range rifle for me. Now, what kind of advantages will it gain you? If you want to shoot past 200 yards with any of these heavy hitting kind of lower velocity cartridges that are so good for this type of hunting, well, you can dial. And if your rifle is zeroed at 100 yards, like we talked about earlier, you can set it up with either just handwritten numbers on your turret after you've calculated your own ballistics, or you can order a custom turret engraved for yards for your load out of your rifle. And then if you range something, let's say you're stalking through thickets and you turn and you look and there's a little saddle from the nearby ravine and there's a big buck walking over the top and he's, you know, 225 yards out and you're shooting a 30-30 or maybe something like a 45-70, but you have that turret, you've worked it out, man, you just dial that thing up to 225 yards Take a deep breath, make a slow squeeze, and go collect your venison, right? You can do it with that type of reticle. The alternate, of course, is to just hold over. And if you practice a lot, you can do that pretty well to 250 yards. But, man, I'd rather put the crosshairs right on the money than try and estimate, hmm, is that 14 inches or 16 inches over that deer's back, right? So my advice is get the dial-up turret and use it refine it, use it. That way your close range hunting rifle has a lot more reach than they ever did in the past. Uh, this sort of turret is especially useful on, as we mentioned, like a 4570, 3030, a 9.3 by 62 with heavy bullets, 35 Whalen, same thing with heavy bullets. Maybe let's say you're running a 35 Remington in a lever action Marlin or super cool. How about a model eight or a model 81 Remington semi-auto? If you want to be able to reach out a little bit with that 35 Remington, which is pretty slow cartridge, right? Big rainbow trajectory. Put a scope on it like this. Practice with it a little bit, and it'll give you more reach than you thought. Your 100-yard gun becomes a legitimate 200 or even 250-yard rifle. Now, how about some favorite scope model recommendations? And again, folks, this is just me. This is my experience, and I'm sharing with you what's worked for me. If you're interested in trying some of them, by all means try them. I'm pretty sure they're going to treat you good. They sure have treated me good. But on the other hand, if you have other stuff that works well for you, doesn't mean you need to switch, folks. There are a lot of great uh, optics out there and, and good iron sight options, too. So let's talk about scopes first. Then we're going to talk about some specific iron sights. So, of course, as mentioned, my very top recommendation for a versatile brush country gun is going to be that uh, 1.5 to 5x Leupold. It's a VX3 HD and it has the CDS ZL turret. And uh, newly from Leupold, you can get it with an illuminated fire dot reticle. When I got mine, it did not have that. So 
I, uh, I'm going to order another one with the fire dot. Okay. The new ones with the fire dot are the suggested retail is six ninety nine. dollars It's fairly high folks because of the illumination. You can usually get one without the illumination for under 500 bucks. Next favorite is that two and a half to eight power by 36 millimeter front end, right? Lupo VX3 HD with also the CDS ZL turret. And those have a suggested retail of $4.99. You can probably, if you're lucky, you'll probably find one for a bit less, especially on a holiday weekend sale or some such thing. Next up, and really probably the most capable and top quality all purpose uh, the, of this type of scope that crosses over really well into the heavy, heavy big bores is the 1 to 5X Leupold in their VX5 HD line. They're more expensive for sure. $12.99 with the fire dot reticle that gives you that little point of light right in the center of your crosshairs. And they have the CDS ZL2 turret so you can dial up a long way if you want to. You're never going to need to on a dangerous game or brush country rifle, but hey, the option's there if you want. I've got one on my uh, 416 Remington Magnum. It's a, a beautiful Kimber that's been refinished by Doug Turnbull, given a color case hardened finish on the action and a darker finish than the original on the stock. Oil rub, uh, it's a really favorite rifle of mine. Something I, I just love and that scope is tremendous. It's uh, given really great results on that rifle. Now there, as mentioned before, there are a ton of other really good models out there by Burris and Trujicon and Leica and Zeiss and Vortex and others. But of course, these are the ones I've personally used the most and really trust. Now, how about something a little bit different? How about a Swarovski Z3? If you think you can't afford a Swarovski scope, think again. This one does not have a dial-up turret. So you're going to be holding over if you want to shoot far, but suggested retail is $7.99. And you can find them for a lot less uh, at your local gun dealer or uh, online, right? It's a 3 to 9 with a 36 millimeter front lens. And that is a beautiful little piece of glass. They're nice and light and just performs tremendously. Very versatile scope for hunting from anywhere, you know, from up close out to 400 yards if you have a flat shooting cartridge. Now, uh, maybe the best of the type in the world, I know that's a pretty brave statement, folks, but let's go with it, is the 1 to 8 power Swarovski Z8i+. Plus. Now, the illum I means illuminated, right? This is probably the single finest close range scope made anywhere. Top glass, bull strong construction, and that legendary Swarovski performance in light transfer, clarity, contrast, color purity, everything. Cost, $3,299. I'm including it because I've used one on Kodiak Island. A loner, right? I can't afford that for a scope personally, but I want to show it to you because it is such a tremendous optic. Uh, I've got one right here currently that I'm working with now. It's going on a 458 Winchester Magnum. Just a stellar optic, but <laughs> oh so pricey, right? Uh, gives you a fantastic magnification range. You can get them with a, a custom dial-up turret system that you can tune to your own ballistics, whatever those may be. Okay, let's shift gears a little bit and go with a scope support system. We're talking backup iron sights or red dots now. So let's circle back and address again just why you'd want a backup sighting system. And I have a story for you. Long ago, <laughs> faraway land, this is not just the previous century, but the previous millennium, folks, I worked as a big game guide in Montana in the Bitterroot Range, guiding for Jeff Lang of Continental Divide Outfitters. And he um, had kind of an interesting experience one fall. He had just a relatively inexpensive but functional scope on his rifle. Coming home one night with his client behind him, he slipped crossing a creek on the rocks and he fell on his back in that creek. Now, it wasn't very deep. It was only about six inches deep. But he fell right on a rock with his scope because his rifle was slung over his shoulder. And that scope, when he pulled it out of the creek and 
shook the water off of it was a gnarled piece of aluminum with uh, pieces of glass falling out of the inside. So he got home, he took the scope out of the rings, which were still intact, and the rest of that um, season, carrying the rifle just for backup, I should say the rest of that uh, period, that week-long hunt, he carried that rifle with nothing but the scope's rings. So he knew, you know, he had to get real close if he was going to finish something off. Story has a happy ending. When the client got home, he bought my boss a brand new Swarovski scope and sent it to him as a tip. Pretty darn cool. And uh, just a great example of what can happen deep in the backcountry. We're a long ways in there. If your scope goes south, whether you fall on it or whatever the case may be, horse rubs it against a tree, there's a lot of different things that can happen. So being able to take your scope off and keep hunting can save your hunt. And uh, over the years, I've kind of planned my backcountry adventure, adventures always with that in mind. So the traditional backup choice is iron sights. And that's still a fantastic option. If your rifle has good iron sights on it, just make sure they're sighted in at 100 yards with your uh, preferred ammunition in that rifle. If you're just to digress a little bit, if you're an open country western hunter, this still applies to you, but I would sight them in at 200 yards. So, what about if you don't have iron sights? Well, you can have them put on most steel barrels. It's not a big deal. Uh, gunsmiths will grumble a little bit because it can be kind of uh, tedious, time-consuming, a little bit of a pain to make sure they're perfectly straight up and down and that they're, um, you know, oriented correct height in relation to your bore and all that. But it can always be done. What if you have something like a carbon fiber barrel with nowhere to fix iron sights to? There's a solution that was suggested to me years back by a listener who just said, well, if you've got cross slot type bases on your action, you can just pull your scope off and clamp on a little red dot in a quick detach mount. And that's a fantastic recommendation. So Ever since, if I'm going into the deep back country, especially with the big bore rifle in country with grizzlies and so forth, I take a little Aimpoint Micro H2 that's been pre-zeroed with my load on that rifle. Then I just take it off, stick it in my backpack, keep it with me at all times. And if I was to have a catastrophic failure with my primary rifle scope, I just pull it off, clamp that aim point on, and I'm back in business. For close range hunting, it's pretty darn good, right? You won't have the light gathering ability at early, uh, early in the morning and in twilight in the evening, but for everything else, you're in pretty good shape. And they're also a terrific choice if you're going into uh, thick brush after either a wounded deer or elk or something or a dangerous game animal, particularly if your eyes don't resolve iron sights well anymore. That's a really important caveat, folks, because if you can't see iron sights, they're just not going to do you any good, right? So get a red dot, if that's the case. These are not cheap. These are military grade. A lot of our boys have done a lot of fighting with these sights, and they last. They're tough. The batteries seem to last forever. They return to zero really, really well. I don't recommend a cheap red dot. I've seen at least probably half a dozen sub $200 red dots fail uh, very quickly. They just don't seem to last well. Okay, what else? You know, if, if you're an iron sight guy and you can see sights pretty well, you want to hunt with those and get the utmost accuracy out of them. You have something like a, one of those Rugers we're talking about, or maybe a rifle mounted with tally steel bases. You can get a clamp on a rear peach sight that will give you added precision. NECG, New England Company of Gunsmiths maybe, something like that, makes a clamp on for the Ruger uh, scope base. You put that on your rear receiver bridge, works wonderfully. And then Tally makes a really nice peep sight that goes on their steel bases. Great option. Of course, barrel sights are the easiest. You don't have to carry an extra little part if you're running with a scope. You just have the sights on there, and when it's time to use them, you use them. And folks, that's about it. Before we wrap up, I've got to tell you that Audrey did get a bear a few years later. In fact, 
she was the first person, as far as we've been able to dig up, that ever took any big game animal with the 7M MPRC cartridge. I had a barrel and uh, put it on a Gunworks Nexus rifle and was working with that cartridge nearly a year before it was announced. And man, she made a perfect shot from 301 yards, uh, dropped a beautiful five and a half foot bore uh, using a good magnified scope, right? So that time she definitely had the right equipment and the right cartridge. It was of course not a close range opportunity, but I just wanted to share with you that Audrey did successfully uh, find closure on her unfortunate first bear hunt. Okay, here's a final thought for you. Unlike your hunting rifle, about which I'll sometimes say it's not what you have, it's how well you use it. Well, making the right choice in optics is crucial. What you have will likely determine how well you can use it. Aging eyes, of course, will never make the most of iron sights. Older hunters, for example, really benefit from red dot sights and from magnified scopes. Make a point of choosing the right sighting system for your close range hunting. It just might make all the difference at the moment of truth. I'm Joseph Von Benedict, and I'll see you in the backcountry.